Today is January 4th, 2024, and my guest is author Brian Kloss of University College London, where he is an associate professor of global politics. His latest book, which is our topic for today, is Fluke, Chance, Chaos, and Why Everything We Do Matters. Brian, welcome to Econ Talk. Thanks for having me on the show. I want to remind listeners to go to econtalk.org, where you can vote on your favorite episodes of 2023. Thank you. And now, Brian, you open your book with two remarkable stories. Uh, one is about Henry Stimson, and one is about yourself. Well, let's start with the Stimson story and how it illustrates the idea behind your book. Yeah, so the, the Stimson story starts with a vacation in 1926 to Kyoto, Japan, and it's a couple uh, Mr. and Mrs. H.L. Stimson, who go on this vacation and just fall in love with the city. And uh, this is relevant because 19 years later, the husband and the couple, Henry Stimson, ends up being America's Secretary of War, who's overseeing the targeting committee, which is tasked with deciding where to drop the first atomic bomb to end World War II. And all of the generals, all the people on the targeting committee basically agree that Kyoto should be destroyed. But Stimson and his wife uh, like Kyoto. So twice he intervenes with President Truman to get Kyoto taken off the targeting list. And so the reason why, the, the immediate reason why the first bomb is dropped in Hiroshima is effectively because a couple that happened to be in the right place and right time 19 years later took a vacation there in 1926. And the reason I opened the book with that is because I think it illustrates how very small changes, decisions about you know where to vacation two decades earlier can cause the deaths of 100,000 people in one city rather than another. And that's the idea behind the book is that there's a lot of randomness, chance, chaos, and contingency that diverts our lives and our societies more than we often think it does. And uh, for completeness, because I found this also uh, quite interesting, uh, the targeting of Nagasaki, the second city that the atomic bomb was dropped on, uh, also had a, a a fluke aspect to it. Yeah, so this is where the uh, the other city that was chosen for the the bombing on August 9th, nineteen forty five, was called Kokura. And the reason why the bomb ended up being dropped on Nagasaki instead was because of brief cloud cover over Kokura. So they thought there were forecast clear skies. They sent the bomber up. These brief clouds flit across at just the right time. It obscures the bomb site, and they don't want to accidentally drop, you know, the second atomic bomb in history not on the target. So they decide to go uh, to, to Nagasaki instead. And so even in Japan to this day, people say Kokura's luck refers to unknowingly escaping disaster. And this is one of the other themes in Fluke is that we often think about the sort of chance contingent events that divert our lives or our societies. A lot of the time we're unaware of them. And in Kokura, they would not have been aware until much later that their city was almost incinerated, except for a cloud. And now tell the second story, as dramatic as those are and thought-provoking, uh, the second one might be even more so. Go ahead. Yeah, so this story starts in 1905 in a little farmhouse in Jamestown, Wisconsin. And it's basically the story of a woman who has four young children at home and, and snaps. She has a mental breakdown. We'd probably call it postpartum depression today, but of course in 1905, they weren't making those diagnoses. And tragically, she decided to kill her four children and then take her own life. And her husband comes home uh, after a day on the farm and discovers his whole family dead, right? Uh, all, all four kids and his wife. And the reason I put this in the book is because this is my great-grandfather's first wife. And she remarried to what was my great-grandmother. Now, I had no idea this story existed until I was in my 20s. And my dad sort of sat me down and showed me this newspaper clipping. I mean, the headline was Terrible Active Insane Woman from the 1905 newspaper. And I had this realization, and maybe subconsciously this is one of the origin stories of this book, but I had this realization that but for that mass murder, I don't exist, right? And not just that, but but I don't talk to you. you. You know, no one is hearing my voice unless there is this mass murder in 1905. And so when I start thinking about it, this informs my social science research, but also my, my philosophy towards life and so on, is that you start to realize that when you actually unpick causality, there are just these series of things back and back and back in history that if they were slightly different, the world would be radically uh, and profoundly changed. And I am a living testament to that because the only reason I exist is because of a mass murder 118 years, 119 years ago uh, in Wisconsin. And um, what's, the, what's the lesson of that? You mentioned both social science and, and your own life. And of course, 
the book is alternates between these two perspectives, um, how we should look at the world, trying to understand it, which is the social science part. And then the second part is how should we live? And we'll be, I'm sure, talking about both those. But start with that. Uh, how should this affect the way we think about social science? Well, I think when you think about how we try to understand the world, uh, we model it, right? And and all of us started modeling it with this idea that we understood. I mean, it was obvious that this is not the real world. This is a crude, you know, sort of funhouse mirror reflection of it. And what I think has happened along the way is we've gotten so consumed with modeling that we've forgotten how reality actually works. And so when you think about trying to model, for example, why did the U.S. drop the atomic bomb on Hiroshima instead of, say, Kyoto? If you were trying to identify variables in a model to choose, the vacation histories of various U.S. government officials would be like 10 millionth on the list that would come to mind, right? I mean, it would be so far down the list. And yet in that instance, it was the main cause. It was the main diversion at the last minute that diverted the bomb from uh, its intended target of Kyoto to Hiroshima. And the same is true, you know, when I think about my own life history, I think, you know, we have all these sort of neat and tidy stories we tell about our, our, our lives. You know, we make good decisions, we take credit for wise choices and so on. And yet I think that not only do we sometimes lose sight of the fact that there's all these contingent moments that could have turned our lives differently, but more profoundly than that, there's unknown moments, right? What I, I sort of say, the invisible pivots in life. And that's because until I was, you know, 20 something years old, I had no idea I was the byproduct of a mass murder. And so I lived my life with that ignorance and that was fine. But it meant that, you know, I didn't understand the actual trajectory of my life history because I didn't have the information necessary. And so I think this is the kind of stuff where, you know, when you think about social science and we try to understand social change, most of us are actually pretty good at doing this with our own lives, right? We think about those pivot points. We can't think about the invisible ones because we can't know they existed, right? But we think about the ones, you know, oh, if I had just turned left instead of right, I not, might not have met my spouse or I might have gone to a different college or whatever it is. When we start to model the world, all that just flies out the window. And it makes sense, right? It's a pragmatic choice, but I think it has reflected back on us a false image of how the world actually works. So the, the idea of the book is to say, okay, if all these small contingent events add up to profoundly shaped society, profoundly different societies and also diverted lives, then everything that we do is constantly reshaping the future. And that's why the, the third part of the subtitle is why everything we do matters, because I believe that even these small chance and seemingly insignificant events do reshape history in profound ways. Well, let's think about the social science part for a minute. Uh, one conclusion you could draw from your book, and you, you mentioned this as a possibility to reject it, but it wasn't so clear to me why you do reject it. We can't really understand the world. Uh, one response to these kind of observations would be there's an infinite number of variables. <clears throat> we can never control for them statistically in any significant way, useful way, meaningful way. And there's an enormous random element in in both history and in our lives. And I think most of us would say that's true about our lives, but we have, I think, trouble, certainly as a trained social scientist in economics, it's troubling to think that while we know that our models are simplified, and even sometimes to the point of being simplistic, the idea that we cannot understand the world because of its randomness, because of the influence of, of small things that are unobservable, does uh, suggest a very pessimistic view of social science. Now, you say explicitly, I think, in the book that that would be a wrong conclusion to draw. So try to walk me through the that that nuance. Yeah, so I think that modeling is, you know, I agree completely with the statement that all models are wrong, but some are useful, right? But I think there's questions about whether there can be models that are harmful. So models that are useful are ones that are trying to tease about tease out aggregate patterns that may or may not hold true in the present moment based on past data, right? I think you get into trouble where you try to model the future from past data if the world has actually changed, right? The problem of non-stationarity, where you're actually modeling a different world from the one that the data you collected uh, previously existed. But I also think you get into trouble when you start to model things that are part of the realm of what uh, Mervyn King, the former governor of the Bank of England, calls radical uncertainty, where literally no matter what you do, you cannot understand it very effectively. And one example they use, which I, I bring into the book, is you know whether or not uh, it's a good idea for Barack Obama to order the raid to kill Osama bin Laden in 2011. And the point was that all the probabilistic estimates, all the forecasts they could make, they didn't have the information they needed, which was, was he there? 
would the raid work? And would the Pakistani government attack the U.S. special forces if they discovered them in time, right? And they had no, there was no data points for this. It, it had never happened before, right? You could look at all the data from SEAL Team 6's su success stories in the past, but that doesn't actually tell you anything you don't know already, which is just they're very effective. But you still don't know whether it's a good idea to, to go there. You don't know if the guy's actually there, et cetera. It's radical uncertainty. There's no information you have that can inform the choice. Now, this is where I split the world into problems that are must answer problems from the ones that are need not answer problems, right? The must answer problems are, you know, you've got a health problem and you need to treat it because you're dying. You can't just say, throw up your hands and say, oh, it's radical uncertainty. We don't know what this rare disease is. Let's just let you die. The same way that, been, you know, Obama had to make a decision. But I think there are problems that we forecast, which we don't need to. I mean, why do we forecast what Burundi's economic growth is going to be in 2030? I mean, we don't know. It's impossible, right? And, and I think what, what is the problem with the latter kind of modeling is that it creates a hubris that I think is dangerous. Because when you reflect the world that is swayed by randomness, chance, and contingency back at you as this neat and tidy set of models, you start to think you can control it, right? Because if the world actually was five or six variables that create this causal outcome that you understand, then you're going to play with the world in ways that you sort of think you can control. And so one of the aspects of why I'm writing this. One is just the philosophy of how the world works is interesting and important to understand. But in terms of pragmatic advice, it's to say, let, let's think carefully about whether we actually have reached our limits on some of these areas. And if we have, we should have less appetite for optimization, more appetite for experimentation, and more appetite for resilience, right? So it's just, it, it's, it's how you interpret the results of a more uncertain world that causes you to make wiser decisions and avoid catastrophe, basically, by by the hubris of certainty that's embedded in some flawed models. So I'm a big fan of hubris, of uh, humility in the face of hubris, and certainly humility about the um, reliability of empirical work. I mean, you tell the rather remarkable story of the um, attempt to measure 76 teams were given the same data on the impact of, um, what was it, immigration on? Social support safety net programs. Uh, and whether, oh, right, excuse me, whether uh, the size of the immigrant population affected the political support for safety net uh, that would benefit immigrants who, quote, weren't like you, possibly. Um, it, tell what happened in that study. It's, uh, I had not seen that. It's in 2022, I think. Yeah, so this, to me, I mean, I, I hope that more people come across this study because of my book, but because uh, it's excellent, excellent research. And to me, this is the kind of study that should have the, the ripple effects that the replication crisis had, uh, you know, a little over a decade ago. So basically what they do is they send out 76 research teams who are not in communication with each other. They give them the exact same data. They say, here's the data to work with. And we want you to answer this empirical question of, does an increase in immigration basically cause a change in support levels for the social safety net? Now, what they found, all these different teams use different methodologies. They, tr they plotted every single choice they made methodologically, said exactly what they were doing, et cetera. But they didn't communicate with each other, so there's no group think. Come up with 76, 76 different ways to model the data. And what they found was about half of the teams, roughly speaking, found a null result, no effect, right? Or at least they could not discern an effect statistically from the data. Roughly a quarter of the teams found a positive effect and roughly a quarter of the teams found a negative effect, both of them being statistically significant. Now, this shakes my faith in social science profoundly because the sure. problem is that normally when social research is done, one team does this and they pick their own data, right? They're not, they're not taking data that's ready-made and, and sort of hand-fed to them. They're, they're making choices already about which data to use, what to include and what not to. But when they had the same data, there was still almost an even split between positive and negative results on this. And most of the time, what would happen is if you got a null result, a lot of people would not publish it, right? Publication bias is a real problem. If they got a positive result, they would publish it and it would become the accepted wisdom if it was in a top tier journal that there was a positive effect. If they got a negative result, they would publish it in a top tier journal and there would be the accepted wisdom that there was no, there was a negative effect. And then there might be years upon years where not only was this viewed as settled research, but that people <laughs> made policy based on it, right? And then at some point, somebody else would come up with a new study, probably using different data and maybe get a different result. And so, you know, the universe of uncertainty paper, which is what this one is called, to me, it signals what I call the, the hard problem of social research, that even when you control the data, even when you try to 
spot the methodological choices and, and try to keep them in the realm of responsible methodologies, you get a scattershot result. And, you know, that worries me. It's something where I think we, it, it shakes the faith that we should have in the idea that a single study can establish definitively whether something is true or false in, in social dynamics. Or five studies, if they all happen to be agreeing and they all happen to be on one of those yeah. quarter that found one side or the other. Um, uh, you know, the phrase studies show is, is, a, is a phrase that I can no longer hear and, uh, and just let it go by. Uh, mentally, at least, I don't always say something, but uh, if it's any comfort, Brian, I think, I think there'd be an interest. I've never seen this uh, a study done on the following: Does social science research actually affect public policy? Uh, social <laughs> scientists like to think it does, but I have a feeling that most of the time, politicians they you know it's an after the fact ex post comfort for them to wave around something that they claim helps to show whatever they're doing, but. It's not obvious that social science um, has much effect. Now, I don't think that's literally true. Um, uh, Keynes' famous quote about uh, uh, listening to madmen is, is, I think, relevant. I think there are, every once in a while, intellectual movements and uh, and books and insights that that do affect the course of the world. But sometimes I I think we're just over here in this sandbox over here. This is a group of, of young children of an older age uh, playing with uh, statistical packages. So it's, 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 I share your unease that this can lead to overconfidence about the impact of say X on Y, but maybe it's not as big as we worry about. I think that's definitely true, by the way, for my realm of political science. <laughs> I don't think, I don't think that we sway policy as much as we like to pretend we do. And, and I think some of that, by the way, is because of some of the flaws that I suggest. I mean, I think there are some aspects of social science that could be improved. And if they were, then maybe people would put more faith in our in our research. But, you know, it's it's still very worthwhile to do. I'm not trying to say we throw the baby out with the bathwater. It's still worth trying to understand the world. And social science is our best tool to do that. So, you know, even though I have what I think is a rather provocative chapter title, The Emperor's New Equations for that, uh, that chapter, I actually very much believe in the mission of social science. I just think that we need to improve how we do it. Yeah, I'm more cynical than you, but that's okay. We'll save that for another conversation. <laughs> um, Talk about one way to organize one's thinking about this that you use is, which I really like, is contingency versus convergence. So talk about those two terms and uh, how they uh, illuminate these these issues. Yeah. So one one of the joys this this book has been was so fun to research because I I really went down the rabbit hole of evolutionary biology, which is it's a historical science. I mean, it it shows us how change happens over time and how trajectories shape future pathways. And so the contingency versus convergence are very easy to understand in evolutionary terms. The best example of contingency is the asteroid that wiped out the dinosaurs and gave rise to the mammals, right? Because if the asteroid had been delayed by a few seconds, you probably wouldn't have had the mass extinction events of the dinosaurs. Mammals might not have become dominant and humans probably wouldn't exist. So a span of a couple seconds, uh, you know, 60 plus million years ago, is the re, you know if if that had been different humanity probably wouldn't exist so that's contingency it's where very small changes can create profound effects convergence is the sort of idea that things happen according to patterns that are relatively stable and ordered because there are pressures on them so in evolutionary terms for example i, I love this this example um, if you look at an octopus eye and you look at a human eye they're extremely similar and they've been evolving on separate lineages for the better part of 400 plus million years. And the reason that happened is just because there's only so many ways that vision can work. And the human eye is one example of a very effective way that vision can work. So when nature accidentally stumbled across this, this sort of solution to a, a problem of how to navigate the world, it stuck. And so con convergence is basically the sort of more ordered viewpoint of the world. And I think, by the way, that social science mostly lives within the convergent uh, worldview. And contingency is the worldview that small changes can throw things up that that radically divert history in the course of of human social change and so on. So uh, I also like to use it in our own lives, right? So con contingency would be the idea of like a snooze button, where you decide, you know, it's a it's a Monday morning, you you you're tired, you slap the the snooze button and sleep for five more minutes. If your life unfolds basically the same way as it would if you didn't hit the snooze button, then that would be a convergent pathway, right? It, it didn't really matter. If your life changes because you get in a car accident, for example, or you know something shifts, or you avoid as, one, yes, exactly, exactly. So, 
that's a contingent event. So it, it's a bo- it's in a framework that's both applicable for our lives and for our societies. I thought the um, you know, a really nice example in there in the book about thinking about history, and we can think about you know fundamental trends that are inexorable, or whether individuals through their own actions. Uh, can offset those trends or create different ones. And you have this thought experiment, which um, is thought, it's not yours. It's um, it's a thought-provoking, though, thought experiment of if you could kill Hitler as an infant, would you? And uh, so talk about why that's trickier than it might seem. <laughs> yeah, so th- this is like, you know, philosophy 101. There's this sort of question of, you know, would you, would you kill baby Hitler? And it, it's supposed to be a thought experiment to figure out your views on utilitarianism. Um, you know, w- would you kill a baby in order to save millions of and millions of people? And the reason why I include it is because that thought experiment actually pivots much more to me on your views about historical causality, right? And how the role of individuals may or may not play a role in diverting trajectories. So if you have a highly convergent worldview where you think the sort of rails of life are not, you know, diverted by individuals, then the baby Hitler question is actually one that doesn't affect the outcome of history, right? Because you figure, well, the structural factors for Nazi Germany to emerge were there. And so if it hadn't been Hitler, somebody else would have done it. And therefore, there's no reason to violate your Kantian ethics and and, and kill baby Hitler. On the other hand, if you think that small changes can have profound effects, and of course, Hitler is not a small change, he's he's an enormous change, then the contingency worldview would say, okay, killing baby Hitler would radically change the course of history and may also make it um, you know, much, much better, save the lives of millions of people for this one baby. So it's, you know, it's, it's that kind of question. There was a, you know, there was a book written by Stephen Fry uh, who, who, who sort of imagined this world in which actually Hitler was never born, but the outcome of Nazi Germany was worse, right? Now, this is very hard to imagine, but the, the premise of the book is that the person who ends up becoming the leader of what was effectively, you know, a Nazi style regime was actually more disciplined than Hitler. And so they acquired the atomic bomb sooner and they won the war. Right. So the the, the point that I'm bringing in is not to comment on the the various, you know, virtues of, of killing or not killing baby Hitler. It's to say that the way that those questions actually should pivot in our minds is based on whether we believe that individuals drive history or whether trends drive history. And I, I'm of the view that individuals can very much drive history because I think much smaller effects change history, as you see with the Kyoto and Hiroshima example. So surely, if a different person was in charge, I do think it would divert history. Go back to the snooze button for a minute. And I think most people intuitively believe, whether they're right or wrong, <clears throat> give your take. Most people intuitively believe that snooze button type things rarely derail the, the path of my life. Sleeping in for a few minutes here or there, uh, stopping to eat at the buffet rather than having the sit down dinner I was planning, um, having a dr- uh, not sure whether I should have a drink before I go to bed a scotch, so I had one one night, not in another. Maybe I wake up with a slightly thicker head, foggier morning the next morning. And it's, of course, possible that because of that, my presentation is awful and I get fired. Uh, I become a drug addict, homeless, fill in the blank, or I'm fired and it turns out I found an incredible job that I wouldn't have even thought to look for. So life is full, obviously, of, of some random events. But I think most people would say that those are rare that they're not the, the um, I say it a different way, this convergence and contingency in our daily lives. There are many broad patterns that, that persist regardless of small choices or interactions we have with the world or with others. And um, there's many that are serendipitous, both for good and for bad, and we don't know what those are. Yeah, so basically, I, I mean, I, I, I agree with you that most people think about the world this way, right? And the way that I would sort of counteract that is by bringing up, I, I have this in the introduction of Fluke, but it's it's this it's this example where I say, you know, everybody sort of intuitively accepts this notion that if you were to travel back in time, you know, don't don't change anything, don't squish the wrong bug, you know, be very careful because you might accidentally change the future in such a way that you get deleted out of the the present, right? And there's there's a Ray Bradbury short story which uh, we'll link to if we can't call the Sound of Thunder that's magnificent that that deals with this. 
Exactly. And the, the Simpsons also riff on this idea off the Bradbury story. And so I think most of us sort of intuitively think, yeah, okay, like fair enough. That, that That's probably good advice. Like if you do squish the wrong bug, if you travel back 800 years or, you know, uh, 2 million years in history, you might actually change the future of the species or the or, or your own life. And we don't think about that in the present. But of course, historical causality doesn't change whether it's past or present. It's the same thing, right? So if, if squishing a bug in the past can divert the trajectory of history in the future, then surely squishing the bug in the present can divert the future as well. Now, what I would say in the more realistic world of our lives is that we just simply are blind to this. I mean, I, I think that you're right, that it's very hard for us to discern these, and our brains have evolved to make pattern detection the prime aspect of what we do cognitively. So we overlook a lot of this stuff. But I, you know, just examples like, I, I've had situations, I'm sure you have, where somebody makes an offhanded remark that's stuck with me, either a profound witticism or, you know, sort of a cutting jab that really made me feel bad, right? Sure. That person has no idea what it's done, but maybe it put me in a bad mood. Maybe then I snap at somebody else, right? There, there's there's ripple effects that happen even on the tiniest things. When you hit the snooze button, you meet different people that day, right? So you, you When you meet the person who becomes your best friend in your life, a series of things had to happen for that exact occurrence to take place, right? Now, you might say there's convergence because you were going to end up at the same school or whatever it was. But, you know, I, I think the ultimate contingency is when we where this becomes crystal clear is when we start to think about which humans get produced. Because without going into graphic detail, the, the, the exact moment of when a baby is made, if it's a microsecond difference, a different human is born, right? And so it's obvious that in that day, even slight variations are going to affect which person is born. But if you keep going back, why do you end up on that exact date in that exact situation? Well, it's a series of events that each have, you know, an infinite regress basically back to the beginning of your life. So my view of, of historic causality is actually that ev when I say everything we do matters, I'm not trying to make some like cute statement about like, you know, we should care about ourselves. I, I'm, I, I literally think that everything that we do affects the shape of the world in some way. We just are, we're blind to how it's diverting um, the future of, of, of our trajectories. And I think that's a very beautiful idea. Of course, most of the time we don't know what that direction will be. Yeah. Uh, if if I'm having a bad day and I struggle to overcome it and I fail and I snap at someone, that puts them in a bad mood and that has those ripple effects you're talking about. And it is possible that by snapping at them, I cause them to reflect on their own lives in a positive way. But most of the time, we would argue that that's bad, that snapping at people, being rude, arrogant, pushy, obnoxious, self-centered is bad for those ripples. Those ripples are – that produces bad ripples. Uh, the, the, part, the challenge, of course, is, is that many of these small things and that, that do make a difference, we don't know how they make a mm -hmm. difference. So the snooze button is a good idea. You know, whether I push the snooze button, I, if, I, if I push it, I may meet – encounters, better, maybe a better word, different people along the way on my, say, bus ride or walk to work or whatever thoughts I'm going to have and so on are all going to be different. But it might be good. They might be bad. I have no idea. It is a bad idea to push the button eight times every morning because you'll eventually waste large chunks of your life, uh, maybe, and, and maybe lose your job if you're constantly late. But I think I would want to make a distinction between things that were the because we are all connected, um, I, I have an idea of causation, even if, though it's imperfect. As I said, sometimes my – what seems like good behavior could lead to bad outcomes or vice versa. But most of the time, I have a theory about those ripple effects, and many times I don't. And the ones that don't are relatively – I would say they have impact, but they don't guide my life because I can't, I can't anticipate them. Yeah, so that, that's a perfect encapsulation because I think you have to differentiate between how the world works and how we should live within it, right? So I think that how the world works shows that these ripple effects are interconnected. And this means, and, this, and I find this a profoundly moving idea, that uh, all of our best moments in life are inextricably intertwined with all of our worst moments in life. And the way I explain that is to say, I am quite literally the byproduct of a, a gruesome mass murder, right? One of the most horrific things that happened that year in Wisconsin, you know, this, these four young children, everything good in my life is directly derived from that. Uh, every, my life is directly derived from that. Every positive impact I've made is directly derived from that. So this horrible event had these consequences that I find subjectively very, very positive, right? Now, 
that doesn't mean you should go out and mass murder people and hope that it produces good effects, right? So, so because there is no way to anticipate the invisible ripples, we should live according to basically a code of ethics, trying to be decent to each other. But, you know, sometimes people doing horrible things does produce very good outcomes. Sometimes people doing really good things produces terrible outcomes, right? This is obvious. But I think that there's something that's still valuable, at least in the way that we process how our lives work and also think about social change in understanding that there is no free lunch. There's no action that doesn't have an impact, right? And, and I think once you start thinking that way, you start to view yourself slightly differently in a way that can be very helpful for people who are you know, thinking about their lives and are going through, for example, a very dark time. You, you think, okay, well, quite literally, in my view of causality, that dark time is the cause of all the good times that are going to come. Now, if it were different, you would have a different life. Now, some of it might be better, some of it might be worse, but that sort of interconnection and unbroken strands of causality, I think, is something that that can sometimes be comforting uh, when, when terrible things are happening. Well, you have a concept you uh, mentioned. Uh, I don't know if it's Nietzsche's concept or uh, whether he was using it from other folks, which I think is very provocative. Uh, it's very relevant to some things I'm thinking about these days. It's the idea of amor fati. I don't know how to pronounce it. It means love of one's fate. So if we look back, um, and my favorite example of this is, <clears throat> I won't spoil the story, but uh, it's called the, I think it's called The Story of Your Life by Ted Chang. It's a short story that deals with this question, and it's a magnificent story. Um, she uses the basis for the movie Arrival, a movie I didn't particularly care for, but the story is that it's based on I love beyond words. The, the idea is that if you look back uh, on your own life and you see all the mistakes you made or the cruelties you endured, uh, in your case, it's a cruelty that happened before your birth that enabled you to be here. But if we think back on those things, uh, often we're tempted to regret them. Uh, we, we say, you know, I wish I hadn't done X or I wish that person hadn't done Y to me because I was traumatized, brutalized by it. But there is a, a tendency, I think, in the human heart, and um, there are many, I think, religious people think about this differently, but if you're not religious, there's still a strong ten tendency in the human heart to say, well, if that bad event hadn't occurred, I wouldn't be me. And I realize, and this is, the, I think, the, the, the profound part of your book, I realize that my, who I am in this moment and my outlook and my sense of, who, of self, my consciousness of self, that's the product of all these thousands of small things, absolutely. And I can't pluck out one of them by itself, this, and you use the idea of a thread. I can't pull one thread out and leave the rest of the cloth of the fabric unchanged so I just didn't have to suffer uh, from that moment, say, of humiliation in, in seventh grade or the, the uh, terrible decision I made to do X, Y, Z on vacation that, that, that caused me weeks of pain and I lost a, a friend, et cetera, et cetera. I'd love to, I love the idea that those things should change. But when I face the reality of, of confronting the fact that if I change any one of those, that butterfly stepped on back 70 years ago, 55 years ago, I won't be me. Yeah. And I think that's probably a fallacy, but I think it's a very human way that we think about our lives. Yes. Yeah, so by the way, I, it's, a, it's not a fallacy rationally. We wouldn't, I wouldn't be me. The idea that, I, that I've, I've embraced it, the amor, the love of Fatih, of my fate, that is, I think, uh, it might be a fallacy, but I think it's incredibly human for us to cope with that, those, those, that suffering we've endured. Yeah, so I, I, I don't think it's a fallacy. I think it's quite literally true. I, th I think that if anything, in your different, if anything different had happened in your life, you would be a different person. And well, I think true. this is this is it's applying <laughs> chaos theory. Uh, you know, it's not it's not to say that you'd be a completely different person. It's not like you you have no genetic makeup, no you know sort of character or personality, but some things would be different about you, and you would be different in this moment, right? And this is just I mean to me it's just ap applying chaos theory to humans. I mean chaos theory is a pretty effective you know uh, and and validated scientific um, theory that shows that. Many complex systems, which I would include, uh, you know, the human mind as well as human society, 
are sensitive to initial conditions and, and slight changes in those initial conditions going forward in time can uh, create profound effects. The, the origin of chaos theory is the weather. And of course, we intuit this when we think, why isn't the weatherman making a forecast, you know, 10 days in the future? It's because tiny fluctuations can create totally different weather systems. I think that's the same for humans, right? And I think actually there's a difference here between what's socially useful in a sort of aggregation and what's individually useful for processing uh, you know, terrible things that happen to us. So I think you're right that it's quite literally true and also that it's a coping mechanism to confront terrible things by understanding that they make you who you are. But I, I actually believe this scientifically is a literal truth, right? Now, on top of this, there is some social usefulness to regret because when we do stuff that inflicts pain on other people and we feel bad about it, that's socially useful. Now, of course, the fact that we did that does make us who we are. That's it's unavoidable. There's no way where you can rewind your life and, and delete that little bit of your of your history. And it then causes you to behave better in the future because you feel you internalize that regret. And then it changes the way that your neural network processes new information. And then you behave differently the next time that you encounter someone. Maybe you're a little bit kinder. Right. So I, I think there's a, a, you can have a parallel idea at, in your head at the same time that Yes, it's actually useful to go back over your life and think about what could have been different, what could have been better as a thought experiment, because that allows you to adapt and be more proactive in terms of making decisions that you're more happy with over the long run. But I also think it, it's not a fallacy to, to use it as a coping mechanism because it is quite literally true. I mean, I am the byproduct of everything that's happened to me. And this is partly because I'm, you know, I, I believe that my mind is basically a physical object. I don't believe there's a difference between my mind and my brain. So if that's the case, then every single thing that has affected my brain structure is every experience I've ever had. Uh, and therefore, if I hadn't had some of those experiences, my brain would process the world differently and I would behave differently. Yeah, just to be clear, I, first of all, I think I used to agree with you about regret. I don't believe that anymore. Um, I don't, although I think regret plays an important role in potentially affecting our behavior. I think it's very difficult for our brains to process regret in that thoughtful way. Hmm. And I, I'm not sure uh, that regret is, um, is that helpful in helping me be better in the future. But put that to the side for a minute. I just want to make clear what I meant when I said uh, it's a fallacy. Hmm. If some of the bad things that I did or that happened to me were pulled out of the, um, the fabric, I would be a different person and I love who I am, but I'd also love who I am if I were a different person. That's all I meant. That, and I sure. might be even yeah. happier. Um, and I think it's interesting, your example of, um, there's a long chapter in your book on free will. And I told you before we started recording, we probably wouldn't talk about it because we'd already gone in, in great depth with Robert Sapolsky on it. But there's a, it's a fascinating parallel between a William James essay and and your origin story. So William James's defense of free will, he, he talks about a horrific murder. And he says, do we really believe that that murder, uh, that the world would not be a better place if that murder didn't happen? Is there any possible way uh, for that murder not to have happened? Wouldn't the world be a better place? Now, it turns out, of course, he, he understands that it Many, many other things would then happen that might be good or bad. In your case, you seem like a fine fellow, Brian. I'm glad you're here. But but I, I think the first wife of your great-grandmother or grandmother? Great, yeah, my great-grandfather. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it would have been a better thing, in certainly in a utilitarian sense, sure. on the surface. We have to be careful because if those four children had lived, one of them could have grown up to be Hitler. You know, it, the world's complicated. <laughs> we can't reliably say that. But I think our sense of morality, and this is James's point, is that if we can't judge that, if we can't, James is saying, we have to be able to say, all of us desperately want to say, I would prefer a world where that didn't happen. And the alternative view is to say, well, it's all, it's all uh, determined, that nothing could freely change anything. And so we want to live in this world right now that, that has many beautiful things and some not so beautiful things. We have to accept all the mass murders of the past, all the cruelty of the past, and all the good things of the past. But I think the idea that, um, that, that there are some bad things that happen uh, is important to say, and I, and I know you don't, I know you agree with that. So I'll let, mm -hmm. I'll let you say it. <laughs> 
Yeah, no, I mean, I, this is the kind of thing where you, you can't, because you can't know the ripple effects of any individual action, the only rational way to live is to try to be as ethical as possible. Now, the question about free will is, is more of a question of where does the cause of those events come from, right? So it's like whether I am able to freely control my my mind separately from my brain, that's a question about causality and free will and the sort of dynamic nature of, of matter, right? But it doesn't change how, because I don't know the answer to that question, then I should try as best I can to behave in an ethical way. I mean, I, I you know, I agree, I agree basically with Robert Sapolsky's viewpoint on this. I, I, I don't believe in free will. Um, and I'm I'm a hard determinist in this sense, but I don't think that it actually pragmatically affects the ways that we should think about our own lives because we just simply can't know. It's it's more to me, it's more of a question about what is the ultimate origin of human behavior, not what is the right kind of human behavior, right? And the right kind of human behavior is obviously extremely uh, ethical. <laughs> now, I one of the things that I think just to pick up a, a thread that we were talking about before that relates to this, you know, when I was talking to uh, whenever you write a book, you kick ideas around with smart people, and I was talking to a historian about the Hiroshima, you know, uh, and uh, Kyoto example. And what he said to me was, he's like, yeah, but like the war was going to end anyway, and the U.S. was going to win anyway, right? And it relates to this idea about the unknown effects, because what I said to him was, I was like, yeah, you're right. Like they would have bombed Kyoto, the U.S. still would have won the war, et cetera. But the world doesn't have categories with binary outcomes, right? So what the way he was thinking was like, the effect of that action was indifferent because the war still ends. I say, yeah, but if 100,000 different people die, and Kyoto no longer exists and Hiroshima does, Japan is going to develop differently, right? Like people who go to Kyoto now, who have been, some of your listeners probably have been to Kyoto, they wouldn't go, they wouldn't have gone there. They might've gone to a different city, right? So like the, 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 the idea that there's like these categories of change that we impose on the world, like did the war end in the way that we expected or not, isn't actually how I think this thread works, right? I think if if one person lives and one person dies and you swap them, I think the world changes. So obviously, if 100,000 different people live or die. So that's what, you know, it's not, and that's an int interesting situation because in the William James story you reference, obviously, it's a choice between murder or no murder. This is a choice between which 100,000 people live or die. And, you know, it, the, the, I think the thing that makes us so uncomfortable with the idea that it was because of a vacation is just because it's so arbitrary. But like, is it better if the reason was because there was a, you know, Japanese aircraft manufacturer in Kyoto? I mean, maybe, but that's also the choice that some random Japanese guy made that caused these people to die. So, you know, my, my point here is I think that there's this aspect where we can't know the ripple effects, but that doesn't mean we should pretend they don't exist. And that, that's the sort of philosophical aspect of this. Everybody else then has to internalize what does this mean for me, right? And I write about in Fluke what this means for me, but the reader is, I think, hopefully going to have a different reaction to it and how you make sense of a world that's more swayed by chance and contingency and randomness and chaos and all this stuff. I hope that I'll get lots of responses that are radically different because I think that's the beauty of the human condition is all of us take an idea and interpret it in our own brains very, very differently. Well, if you're right about free will, it, it doesn't matter because it's all pre- determined yeah, already. <laughs> it's in what James calls the iron wall of uh, one event coming after another in inexorably. Uh, I want to read, uh, and by the way, I mean, I think the claim that we would have, quote, would America would have won, won the war anyway, is um, it's an untenable claim. There's no way of knowing. Yeah. Um, and of course, the bomb was dropped not to, quote, win the war versus lose it. That's the binary part I think you're 100% right about. That's the wrong way to think about it. The, the reason the, the bomb was dropped, whether this was moral or not, it's obviously a, it depends on what you consider moral, but it was dropped to save what was thought to be the loss of hundreds of thousands and maybe a million, if not a million lives in an invasion. And of course, that might not have been necessary either. Maybe the, you know, the emperor could have had a heart attack and, the, and, and things would have changed. But these, these are the issues I think that are... Um, much harder ex ante than ex post. But I want to read I want to read a beautiful paragraph uh, that sums up what we've just been talking about. And you can expand on it if you want or not. But it's it's a beautiful summary. You say, quote, our best and worst moments are inextricably linked. The happiest experiences of your life are part of the same thread in which you suffered the most crushing despair. One couldn't follow without the other. That may sound strange, but I obviously wouldn't exist if my great-grandfather's first wife hadn't murdered her family. So my most joyous moments are unavoidably tethered to that horrific tragedy. 
In a literal sense, our most euphoric moments couldn't exist without their suffering. That doesn't mean that we should celebrate suffering, but that future elation, elation will emerge directly or indirectly from seemingly senseless suffering can be a consoling truth that blunts our worst moments of pain. Conversely, my joyous moments will in some way lead inexorably to someone else's agony or my own. That's just the way it works. For good or ill, I find this mind-bendingly beautiful, providing the most vivid sense of interconnection between all things intertwined across space and time. Close quote. Want to add anything? It's a beautiful quote, beautiful paragraph. Thank you. Uh, no, I mean, I, I think that sums up the main, the main ideas. I, I just... I think when when I talk to people who are dealing with problems in the modern world, and I think there are a lot of people who are dealing with problems in the modern world right now, um, it's it's this idea I think is one that is both true and comforting, but it's also something where it's derived from a sense, for me at least, that you know if the world is intertwined in this way, and if if our lives can be swayed by forces seen and unseen, sometimes random, sometimes small we have a little bit less control than we think we do, right? And I think we're sold this world where like you are in control, right? So the self-help industry is basically an industry that tells you it's your fault you're not happy, right? Because here's the here's the recipe to being happy and, and wealthy and so on. And the world just doesn't work that way. And I think it lets us off the hook a little bit. I think that's the other aspect of this that I find helpful is, you know, we, I, I repeatedly use this quote, um, and and it's it's sort of this idea that we control nothing, but we influence everything. And when you start to think about it that way, combined with the aspects of what you just read, I think it lets humanity sort of be a little bit messy and be a little bit, you know, imperfect. And it's okay. Um, so it, it's it's funny. I, I, it's really nice to have uh, to, to chat with you as someone who has so clearly read the book. Right, this is very rare with interviewers. Um, <laughs> But it's so nice to chat about it because the thing that I find I found so interesting reading, researching all this was I think these ideas are actually really linked across disciplines. And it's rare to have someone like on your show where you'll have, you know, a trained social scientist that's thinking critically about the philosophy behind these things and also the science behind them and so on. And that we're all grappling with the same puzzles. We're just totally different, you know, silos. And like the, the, the passage that you read is actually linked to questions of physics, right? There, there's like, For sure. what is this actually about the way the world works causality in, in terms of causality? So, um, I, I, yeah, I mean, I think the, the, the passage you read sums up my views on this, but um, I, I do love that there is, philosophy to be derived from physics. There is, you know, sort of import for the way we live our lives from things that we think about social research and so on. And they're they're not as separate as we pretend they are. Yeah, and most of the social science things that we read, as you point out, and uh, talking about self-help books, which are often based on research um, uh, and studies that show that this will make you happier, this will lead to a better life and so on. Those are not reliable. Uh, but they're deeply appealing to us. We deeply want those magic formulas to get rid of uncertainty, to assert the feeling of control, uh, and so on. And I think um, uh, a lot of those theories are simply just misleading. And and the real uh, – those of you out there have read my book, Wild Problems, you know, part of my th theme in that book is that – and it's a theme in your book, Brian – is uh, uncertainty – is not something to be uh, conquered. It's something to be embraced. It's not, it's the essence of life. And and as you point out, I think I pointed out also in my book, uh, you don't want to know how the story ends. Uncertainties actually would be deeply disturbing if you were to know uh, it, the date of your death or how you're going to die. Uh, there's an Econ Talk episode about that. I've forgotten who it was. Um, but th that's that's deep. Uh, it's um, Michael Blaslin is the guest. So th that would be deeply disturbing. And yet we are constantly trying to overcome this unease that we have at, at being unable to control things. So uh, I think the lesson for how to live – I think I know what the what the answer is. It's not an answer that's easily accepted. I think for us as human beings. So maybe talk about that a little bit. Yeah. So in addition, I completely agree with everything you said. But in addition to that, I think we also don't know what we actually want necessarily. 
right? True. And what I mean by that is not to sort of, you know, suggest that people can't understand themselves, but rather to say that sometimes forced experimentation in a world of uncertainty is a very good strategy. I think this is true, by the way, in, in business and economics, but I think it's also definitely true in people's lives. And one of the examples um, that that's Tim Harford uh, originally popularized this, but I think it's just a beautiful example, is the story of Keith Jarrett and the rickety piano. And yeah. basically he comes to the Cologne Opera House you know, for this packed crowd to play and they've screwed up the piano order. And so there's no, there's no like grand piano for him. There's just this like practice piano that's really terrible. And as a result, he has to play the concert on it, but he adapts himself to the piano, changes things a little bit, you know, plays with it, basically experiments. And this is the best selling jazz album of all time because this unexpected forced experimentation actually produced something really beautiful. And the same story is the, the story right before that in the book is about the um, the London tube strikes where they have this sort of all of a sudden the you know the, the way that you get to work is shut down for a day, and when they when economists tracked mobile phone data uh, geolocation data they found that like five percent of commuters who had to choose a different route because of the strike stuck with the new path after the strike which which suggests they had found either a better option may not have been faster might have just been more pleasant. Um, maybe they walked instead of taking the tube the next time, et cetera. But it, it was sort of, it forced people out of this rut. And I think there's a, a lesson there that yes, uncertainty is actually have, it actually has some upsides because as you say, scripted lives are, are, are boring and sad, right? Like the idea that we already know exactly when we're going to die or exactly which partner we'll, we'll, we'll end up with and so on is, 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 you know, takes a lot of the serendipity out of life, but also that the experimentation aspect um, is a way to live within this right? Because you don't know. And the, the false sense of certainty causes you to optimize in ways that sometimes are, are unintentionally harmful, even if they are efficient. Yeah, I think the one way to think about this is to think about downside, upside, and the magnitudes of those. Um, and I, I write about this, you know, the idea of optionality. If there's a downside to a decision you make, but you can stop it, you can cut that downside short and not be stuck with it. It's a very different world than one where you're stuck with it for a long time or, or, or you can only reverse it at a horrific cost. And then the same is true, of course, for upside. Many of the decisions we make, upside's very small, very limited, might be unlikely. But most of the things we do, a lot of the things we do anyway, for in my experience, maybe I'm lucky, is there's a small chance of something happening. If it happens, the upside could be enormous and you have no idea whether what that's going to be. You know, it's it's a, a whole different level of uncertainty, but you open yourself to that kind of opportunity. And, uh, you know, uh, so many of the best things that have happened to me in my life were uh, unimagined. They weren't planned. They weren't predicted. They weren't predictable. Um, and certainly most of the best conversations I've ever had outside of EconTalk, the, the random encounters I have with people uh, that that were deeply meaningful to me were chance encounters. They weren't where I said, oh, I bet that's going to be a really interesting person. It, I'm going to have a meeting at two o'clock with that person. And often it's just a, a chance encounter with a stranger. And um, I think I think it's a wonderful thing to be open to that kind of uncertainty, knowing that if the person's not interesting, you, you don't talk as long. And if they're fascinating, you dive in deeply. And I, I just think so much of... Uh, the good things in life come from embracing that rather than running away from it. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And I also think that the downside uh, discussion you just had is also where I think that the world that you have about how uncertain the world is or how uncontrollable the world is, is proportionate to how much resilience you build into systems, right? And this is where I think there's the danger of overconfidence in sort of, you know, the variable driven life where you sort of say, okay, if we just get these five variables in place, so everything will be fine or the self-help you know, recipe for improving your life. When you have that false sense of certainty, you discount resilience. You discount those sort of exit ramps that you talked about in the downside. And so you know, I think this is where, even if it's something where we can't necessarily know where the chance encounters are going to come, if you accept that they do actually play a significant role in our lives, you plan differently. And so it's where the idea, the philosophy, the worldview can actually affect your decision making in a positive way, um, simply by accepting that you don't have as much control as you thought you did. Now, I want to read a, another quote that uh, you alluded to it a minute ago, the idea, and I think it's um, it's a very provocative idea. And it comes, uh, a recent conversation with Paul Bloom, 
had a similar conversation with Agnes Callard. Um, I probably had others. But this question of whether we're making progress or not in, in humanity and whether our um, uh, our societies are better than they used to be. Uh, and this is this is your quote, quote. This is the paradox of 21st century life. Staggering prosperity seems to be tethered to surging rates of alienation, despair, and existential precariousness. Humans have constructed the most sophisticated civilizations ever to grace the planet, but countless millions need to medicate themselves to cope with living within them. We can control more of the world than the ancients could have imagined. Scraping minerals out of the earth, powering them with a flow of electrons we can direct or disrupt, conjuring up images on our screens of wizards and aliens and superheroes that once existed only in fanciful, fanciful minds. Now we're even starting to be able to invent other minds capable of producing their own art and literature. Where has it got us? On every measurable metric, we're better off than ever before, but many of us feel worse off for it. Close quote. Um, talk about that. I think that's a – that might be true. Uh, part of me uh, accepts that summary of, of modern life. I, I worry that I've – you know, I'm 69 years old and I've just become, um, you know, an old curmudgeon who thinks that everything's worse even though it looks better. But I think there's some truth to it. So what are, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean I, I think there's some of this aspects where um, – I do think this is tied to this sort of optimized view of the world, the sort of constant optimization, the hustle culture. Um, and I think lots of people live what I call a checklist existence, which is where every goal yields another goal, right? And it's just sort of this, you know, there's lots of people who've written about the hedonic treadmill and how you sort of, you know, are constantly trying to keep up with your, you know, ever everlasting stream of goals, because if just this one change and I'll finally be happy. You know, I think there's a lot of stuff in, in in life where accepting a lack of control and accepting uncertainty is actually the most useful way you can spend your time <laughs> and trying to get to that point. I mean, I you know, this is where this this book also has changed how I, you know, think about lots of things. I was I looked at the pandemic, I'm sure for a lot of people, as for me, did this as well, where I sort of grappled with my mortality uh, a little bit more than I, I usually would. And I look at, you know, sort of February 2020, and it's like my Google calendar is just full of stuff I didn't want to do because there might be some unknown benefit to my career at some point. And then I started to think, you know, I'm going to die at some point <laughs> and I'd rather do things I enjoy. So there's some of that aspects where I think intrinsic, you know, enjoyment of life is something that we're often told is actually something you should put on hold in order to, you know, complete the checklist and achieve the everlasting supply of goals. So it's not to say don't strive, right? I mean, humans are naturally striving beings and we should be, we should always try to improve our lives however we can. It's just to sort of focus on what actually matters to us. And, and I think that that's something where, again, when you start to think philosophically about some of the ideas in Fluke, you start to grapple with the question of like, is it really the stuff that I've been told is important, right? Is it the fancy car, the big house and so on? Some of that might be important to people. Some of it might make people happy. But, but for others, I think they're being sold a recipe that doesn't actually, um, you know, deliver what they want. So, you know, there's, there's aspects of the last few chapters of the book where I'm trying to grapple with the meaning of some of these aspects of, of interconnected contingency and so on. Um, but, I, but I do think there's this, there's this pretty predominant Western worldview about individual agency where you basically are in control of your own world. You're the main character in life and you're supposed to go through that, that sort of, game of, of life, accruing the largest slice of the world you possibly can, which is the most stuff, you know, the most prestige, et cetera. I think a lot of people live their lives that way and then feel quite empty with it. So, you know, if, if that's not you, if, if, if that's how you feel happy, then by all means, you know, like live the way you want. But for me, it's just to prov provocatively challenge some people and say like, you know, think a little bit about that. And if you do have a little bit less control and you aren't able to sort of, you know, order off the menu of life, everything you're supposed to want, what can you make yourself happy with? And for a lot of people, those things are, are actually free and available. They're with other human beings. Um, they're with other experiences that are free. Um, and I, I wrote a lot of this book right after I went on walks with my dog, which was, you know, where I started thinking. And that was free and it was really enjoyable. And it, it's something that gave my life a lot of meaning to grapple with these ideas. So, 
I don't know. It's fun. I, I just, this is the only book I've ever written that I think has changed who I am. <laughs> I'll put it that way. Um, the other books, I felt like I was transmitting knowledge I already had. And this is when I was talking to people and engaging with concepts, uh, you know, the kinds that you talk about on your show all the time that I just, frankly, as a political scientist who was sort of sheltered, hadn't really read evolutionary biology and physics and all these other things and, and some of the deeper questions of philosophy. And they made me think more critically about some of the things that I thought intuitively were correct about how the world works. My guest today has been Brian Kloss. <clears throat> His book is Fluke. Brian, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thanks for having me. It was a serious, serious pleasure. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.